Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Stop the Bleed, familiarization course. If you have questions about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in our program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. One continuing education credit has been approved for nurses, social workers, and EMS for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation, as well as take the post-test. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on May 31, 2019, and two years for social workers and EMS, expiring on May 31, 2020. And now, let's meet our presenter. Jacob Fannin is a state coordinator for the Alabama Stop the Bleed Initiative and Risk Management Coordinator for the City of Troy. Mr. Fannin, let's begin. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it the opportunity to be here. Um, as she said, my name is Jacob Fannin and I'm the risk management coordinator for the city of Troy. That's what I do full time. Um, uh, with the city of Troy and also away from there, I'm, I'm the Alabama state coordinator for the National Stop the Bleed Initiative. <clears throat> and um, uh, as of March of this year, uh, I was asked to join the National Board of Directors as well. So I'm very excited to have an opportunity to participate internally as far as what's going on nationwide. Um, so I'd like to talk about Obviously, I'm here to talk about Stop the Bleed, but I'm, I'm, I hope to mention the National Stop the Bleed Day and talk a little bit about it as well, because we were able to train uh, over 800 people in Alabama just uh, our first year alone, and that was with kind of, you know, ragtag, throwing it together as quickly as we could, but we'd like to quadruple that number next year, of course. You know, we want to make it bigger and better every year. Uh, we trained well over 30,000 people nationwide on National Stop the Bleed Day and it happened in a very short period of time, so we're really excited about that. Um, so, about Stop the Bleed. Um, Stop the Bleed was a White House-backed initiative as a result of the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, after the Sandy Hook shooting occurred, a uh, large body of subject matter experts got together um, in, uh, and decided it was, it was a combination of the White House, the American College of Surgeons, the home, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and several other organizations that got together and decided if we can stop preventable death on the battlefield, what's causing us to allow it in the public sector? And that includes uh, the pre-hospital setting as well. Uh, what, what, what's the missing link in the chain? And um, so they took uh, tactical combative casualty care or tactical combat casualty care, TCCC, and a lot of you will be familiar with that, uh, some may not. But it's a, um, a two to three day course that the military issues or teaches to every soldier. As a matter of fact, the Department of Defense just recently within the last couple of months made a decision that uh, TCCC or Combat Lifesaver, it's known by a couple of different names, would be mandatory for all branches of the military. Uh, and my understanding of that, regula that regulation would be everybody from the, from the potato pillar to the four star general. So that, that's going to save lives. We already know how productive and how uh, thorough the, pro the program is now, and as a matter of fact, it's got uh, TCCC has gotten preventable battlefield death almost down to zero. Now, there are always going to be those instances of injuries where we know that there's just nothing that can be done for that individual, uh, but as far as preventable, what we consider to be preventable death, those numbers have fallen to almost, almost nothing. Um, so we correlate that to the civilian market. Um, you look at the Boston bombing, uh, the Pulse nightclub, Columbine, um, the, uh, num the numerous, numerous other examples of active shooters, terrorist attacks, bombings, uh, large crowds of people being run over by vehicles. If I guess that really the, the takeaway there is that it doesn't matter what area code you get shot or stabbed in, the body for the most part treats it the same and the treatment for the most part is the same. Uh, of course, you know, other concerns being taken into consideration. But um, so Stop the Bleed was born from the Sandy Hook shooting. The American College of Surgeons uh, pushed out what's called the Hartford Consensus. 
Uh, you will see a little bit, uh, and I'll flip around here for just a second there on the screen. Uh, what I'm seeing now is what's called a little snapshot of the Hartford, Hartford Consensus. And in a nutshell, what that did was explain to people and give them some sort of framework or guideline of what should I do if I find myself in a mass casualty incident where there may be a high volume of loss of life. And we know statistically speaking that the, that the most prominent cause of death in these incidences or in trauma in general is hemorrhage. Life-threatening bleeding is causing over 20% of the preventable death in America. Uh, currently, the most uh, common cause of death in America between the ages of 4 and 45 is trauma. And over 20% of that is where we see the bleeding come in. Um, that, that equates to somewhere, and this is, these are rough numbers, but that equates for somewhere right around 400,000 people a year that would otherwise be here uh, that are not as a result of uh, bleeding to death. And those are preventable deaths. Um, the vast majority of these people that are bleeding to death are, are, uh, are bleeding from extremities, arms and legs. That is uh, something that can be easily uh, corrected with the application of some sort of extremity tourniquet. Uh, there are several that are TCCC approved, um, the CAT being one of them, the uh, soft T wide, uh, the SWAT T, which is uh, Tactical Officers Association approved, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. So, um, so the Stop the Bleed program was born, and it originally was intended and more focused on teachers because obviously after the Sandy Hook shooting, that was a, there was a great deal of concern about school safety, just as there is right now in the news. Um, following that event in Florida. And uh, it was taught uh, kind of, it was, it was, it flew under the radar for a while, for several years. Um, and it has grown in popularity, thankfully, uh, to the benefit of the public and the first responders as well. It has slowly started to take hold in police departments all across the country and in pre hospital environments as well. Uh, we are now starting to see, uh, for example, I, I've, I've just use my municipality as, an, as a, a, a good example of a forward-thinking administration, not only in the police department, but the mayor's office and the city council, where we have every officer, every officer is trained in Stop the Bleed. Every officer carries an on-body tourniquet. It's required by SOP, uh, and they go through annual refresher training on that material. Uh, they're all re now required to carry trauma kits in their patrol vehicles. They can, they can pack wounds with hemostatic galls. They can apply chest seals to penetrating trauma, and of course, primarily uh, stopping any kind of extremity bleeding with a tourniquet might be on themselves or, or a, c a civilian or their partner or whoever. Um, so we jump forward a few years to, uh, to National Stop the Bleed Day. And now what we're seeing is uh, the Stop the Bleed campaign is, is much more involved in the public arena. Um, you're starting to see, and, and I hope to, to see this trend continue, whereas you go into large uh, airports, for example, and Stop the Bleed kits are hanging on the walls next to an AED. Um, my goal and the goal of the National Stop the Bleed campaign uh, board of directors is to one day see a Stop the Bleed kit hanging on the wall next to every AED, a Stop the Bleed kit in every church, a Stop the Bleed kit, uh, multiple Stop the Bleed kits in every school. Uh, these are things that, um, these, are, these causes of death are preventable with, with minimal training and minimal tools. Um, Andrew Fisher, one of the spearhead uh, of, of TCCC and Stop the Bleed nationwide, uh, just an incredible guy, he, um, he made the comment not too long ago, and it's so true, that we focus, uh, millions of people are, are certified and trained every year in CPR. And statistically speaking, in the pre-hospital environment, in the layperson environment, we know that the survival rates are very, very low, yet we focus so much of our attention on that. Not that we shouldn't, we should. We should save every person and work on them to our last breath, we should. But why are we not putting that same focus on the people that are bleeding to death? And I want people to think outside of the box. Don't, don't focus this on gunshot wounds, stab wounds, and amputations that it, that it and that's, th those are the things that it was probably originally built around. But think outside the box. Think of a motor vehicle accident. You're driving home after work and you run up on a bad car wreck. You walk up to check on somebody and you see a large amount of blood inside of the vehicle or on the ground. Um, your t-shirt's probably not going to cut it. You cannot make, there's only so many things you can MacGyver yourself out of. Um, think about at home, a loved one with a chainsaw or on a tractor, an industrial style accident inside of a, a farm setting or a warehouse setting or a factory setting. Um, 
of course, police officers are, would be a, a perfect example of where this curriculum would be appropriate. And, uh, and thankfully, it is gaining popularity. It's gained so much popularity inside of law enforcement that it is very common, almost within maybe even once, I'd say once a month or so, we're starting to see reports on social media of either news articles or body cam footage where officers are applying extremity tourniquets pre-hospital long before EMS is able to arrive on scene to treat that patient. And that's something uh, that I want to talk about also. We're all aware, or we should be very conscious of the trauma gap. And that really, in, all, in, a, in, a, in itself is what's killing these people. Um, the incident occurs versus the time that the police department arrives, the time it takes them to secure the scene, specifically when violence is involved, and versus the time it takes still looking at the time of call versus, or the time the incident occurred versus the time EMS makes contact with the patients. If you look at specifically like the Pulse nightclub, there was, it was a, a, a large gray area there, that trauma gap that occurred from the time law enforcement was inside the facility in contact with people bleeding uh, at, at, a, at a dangerously high volume, which in, which in turn killed uh, quite a few of them, versus the time that it took for EMS to get there. And that's no knock at EMS, it's not their fault. We all know that, that pre-hospital care providers are chomping at the bit to get in there and work on that patient. That's what they do. But some, cir some circumstances just, don't, just won't allow it due to the, the, the nature of the, of the beast. Um, so because the trauma gap does exist, uh, we have uh, no excuse as to not teach the Sunday school teacher, the lunchroom lady, the guy on the back of the garbage truck, or the police officer, or the firefighter, or the paramedic in the ambulance, or the, or the whoever, or the office worker. There's really no reason that, that we have not to teach this individual how to save their own life, apply a tourniquet to themselves, or one, or one of their coworkers or their loved ones. Um, there's the days of, of laying around and, and you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Uh, those days are over. There's no excuse for it. Uh, we have the, the means and the uh, equipment to teach these people, and, and we should. So I would encourage everybody that's watching this to, to take advantage of this material and, and use it, push it out into your, your workplaces, your churches, your communities, or you know, however you see fit. Um, so one thing I do want to talk about, let me flip forward here for just a second. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm seeing. So obviously we know that 911 is going to be involved. Um, there's, for those of us that have been in the pre-hospital setting before, we understand that there's going to be a, a gap. Uh, several minutes of gap between the time the incident actually occurs and the time 911 is called. There's a couple of minutes there that we've burned. Then we've got the uh, you know average three to seven minute response time, depending on where you're located, whether it be rurally or, or inside of a, a large municipality or something. Um, and then of course, if there's violence involved, the police have to secure the scene. So as you can see, the time continues to stack against the patient who's bleeding. Um, so that's something to take into consideration as well. Of course, we want to start with bleeding control because that's what this is all about. So let me talk about some of this stuff that you see. Everything you see out on the table in front of you is the, the, the really the meat and the potatoes of the, of the Stop the Bleed program. Um, it, of course, it's focused on uh, extremity bleeding with tourniquet application. The next step would be uh, to, to coil any bleeding that may be occurring inside the junctional areas of the body, the neck, the shoulders, the armpits, and the pelvic girdle. Uh, large meaty areas like the thighs, if you know, you've got a gaping wound there, you want to pack it and apply a dressing. Uh, and then of course the next most preventable uh, cause of death would be some, would be a respiratory issue or lack thereof, some sort of penetrating trauma to the chest or the back uh, or the abdominal area we would cover with chest seals or something that's non-permeable and we'll talk about that in a second. So specifically let's talk about a, a tourniquet. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what it is and how it works. Um, these things have come a long way. Um, in, in Vietnam, we were still using Civil War era pain management. Um, that's just how far we've come in such a short period of time. In the last 10 to 15 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've made tremendous leaps and bounds by way of, of being able to prove through, uh, through studied medicine, right? It, it's proven battlefield medicine, and we translate that to the public arena. Uh, that this stuff works. There's, there's no doubt about it. So let's talk about one big medical myth when it comes to tourniquet application, and hopefully nobody out there still believes this, but if you do, let's stomp it right now. There have been zero loss of limb associated with tourniquet application in the last 10 to 15 years that we're aware of, that I'm aware of, zero. Uh, back in the day, um, not too terribly long ago, the, uh, the 
the protocol for uh, dealing with life-threatening hemorrhage was to try a list of about eight or nine things, and then the last resort was to apply a tourniquet as, because they, they thought that you might lose the limb. Uh, tourniquets have been implied, uh, applied in orthopedic surgery for four to five, six hours at a time with no, no long-term effects for many, many years. So why in the world can't we do that out on the street? Um, there's been cases overseas where soldiers have had uh, tourniquets applied in the field to an extremity, an arm or a leg for, for five, six, seven, eight hours. And the only long-term effects that were noted were, uh, you know, months later they would report slight tingling in the fingers that would come and go. But there have been zero extremity amputations as a result of this product documented that I'm aware of or that have been in any case studies that I've seen in the last several, several years. Um, so there is data to back that up. Um, unfortunately, there is a medical myth that still follow these things around, and people do believe that if you put it on, you are going to sacrifice the limb. That could not be further from the truth. So I can't hammer that, that thought home enough. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a tourniquet, first of all. The wider, the better. And that's why we, we, we don't encourage people to, to MacGyver or, or you know, make a tourniquet out of a cord or anything like that. We know that the wider, the better. Uh, the better occlusion, or the, the less work it will have to do to occlude the underlying tissues, pushing that artery against the bone to l shut that blood flow off like a garden hose, for lack of a better term. So as far as this tourniquet specifically is, is uh, designed to work very simply. There's an internal band controlled by this stick here called the windlass that actually when you, when you turn it, that's what constricts the tourniquet and occludes the blood flow to the extremity. Tourniquets can be successfully applied on a, the lower portion of an extremity, where these, these areas of the body where we have two bones instead of one. So you can successfully apply them two to three inches above the bleeding site. However, uh, unfortunately, in, in, in not only, I hate to keep using the word battlefield, but that's where a lot of this science came from. But we've learned in general that uh, arteries sometimes have a tendency to have a little bit of elasticity to them. They have, they have sprung back, for lack of a better term, retracted into, uh, into, the, into the extremity, and the tourniquet being too low has actually caused the bleeding to continue above the tourniquet. So now what we teach in TCCC and TECC, which is tactical emergency casualty care focused on law enforcement and, uh, and the civilian market, um, is high and tight. The old adage, of, we have a, a saying called go high or die. So we place the tourniquet as high on the extremity as we can get it without being on a joint. So the way that works is, and I'll use this mannequin here as a perfect example. All right, so red tip to the inside of the patient's body. Our wound site is here or anywhere between this joint and down. So we place the tourniquet on the patient's body. Red tip to the inside. Pull 100%. Let me get this out of the way. Pull all the slack out of the tourniquet and lay the tail down on the self-adhesive band. So what I'm doing is is I'm opening the tourniquet like this, the Velcro, taking all the slack out and laying the belt down on the self-adhesive band. It will stick to itself as this is uh, military-grade Velcro. So once I've taken all the slack out of the tourniquet, that's the number one mistake that most people make. They don't take the slack out of the tourniquet. So that's, that's the most common mistake we see, the most common thing that will cause the tourniquet to be overstressed or potentially fail. So we take all of the slack out of the tourniquet lay the self at he's in bam back down on itself. Now we're at the point where we need to turn the windlass and this is what will actually con uh, cause the, the tourniquet to constrict like a boa constrictor. So we'll turn the tourniquet or turn the windlass rather a couple of times. The goal here is to turn the windlass until the bleeding stops. Now depending on your patient, their age, your environment, the temperature, their medication they may, may or may not be on, the mechanism of injury, all sorts of other factors involved. It may take two to three turns to occlude the blood flow. It may take three or four. It, it just depends on a lot of circumstances. However, over uh, overwhelming majority, I would probably say at least in the high 90, 95% of the time, if you take all the slack out of the tourniquet before you turn the windlass, you will be successful in application. Go as high on the limb as you can get it without being on a joint. Obviously, we know common sense should prevail for the majority of us and understand that we can't put a tourniquet on a joint. And I'll show you in just a moment how that works and why that would fail. So we'll turn the windlass until the bleeding stops. We would tuck any tail, any excess tail, inside the windlass retention device. And the reason we want to tuck our tail is because if we don't, inevitably, uh, things always go wrong when they don't need to. So as we're transporting this patient, moving this patient from A to B, we might get the tail caught on something, ripped free, which would then cause the tail to, uh, 
to be pulled away from the tourniquet and turn, cause the tourniquet to fail. Last but not least, close the retention device here. So what this does is this retention strap is going to make sure that the belt or any excess belt and the windlass, of course, which is one of the most important parts of the tourniquet, make sure that they're both secured. The reason we want the red tip to the inside, as I mentioned earlier, is because if you put the red tip to the outside of the patient, there's two problems you can incur. Number one, the tail will be hanging out here, which means it can get caught on something and rip free. And number two, your windlass, this rigid device here, can get caught on something and busted, and the tourniquet can fall apart, cause the patient to start bleeding again. If the if the tourniquet, or excuse me, if the windlass and all this really important stuff right here is facing to the inside of the patient, you're less likely to have it caught and bust free. So there's just some logistical issues there as far as moving the patient is around around is concerned. So red tip to the inside. You get the tourniquet set back up correctly. Okay, so red tip to the inside. I'm gonna I'm gonna purposely intentionally put this tourniquet on incorrectly. So what you're seeing me do here is incorrect, and I'm doing that on purpose. I'm going to put the tourniquet up here high on top of the actual joint itself, and that's what happens when you put a tourniquet on a joint. It will fail, and that applies to you know, wrists, elbows, knees, shoulders, whatever. A tourniquet does need to be as high as you can get it on the extremity without being on an actual joint. As, as we all know, the patient obviously you know, may or may not still be conscious, and if they are, there's a high probability they'll be flailing around flapping their wings, so we don't want them to knock the tourniquet out of place. Of course, you want to reassess tourniquet application every two to three minutes um, if you can, if you have that luxury. If not, you know, when you go back over your patient, do your second and third assessments or whatever you have time to do, you always want to reassess any treatment, you know, and that tourniquet would be um, no different. So when it comes to extremity tourniquets, and I'll put this one on my arm just to give you a good example, and I don't know if the camera will be able to pick up on this or not. Pull all the slack out, tourniquets as high as it can go. Lay the tail back down on itself and turn the windlass until the bleeding stops. So I'm going to include the blood flow to my left arm. I'm going to tuck the tail and then close the gate. Just that simple. Okay, now in just a few moments, you'll start seeing a powdering effect, what I call zombie arm. You'll start to see uh, that, that uh, flesh color or, or pinkish color leave that arm as there is no blood flow in or out of the extremity. For a tourniquet to be successfully applied, there has to be no blood flow in or out of the arm. Uh, one of the worst things that, that you can do, and we've, we've proven this over the years, is one of the worst things you can do is loosen the tourniquet to, to give the patient a dose of blood. That's, that's something that used to be very common. Um, the only person that needs to remove a tourniquet is a doctor. Uh, Pre-hospital providers do not need to remove tourniquets unless it's, it's some, kind of, some sort of very major life-threatening problem. I, I've never heard an example of where that was necessary, um, but it is taught by TCCC and TECC standard that once the tourniquet's on, it's on. Nobody should remove it um, until you get to that emergency department and they see fit. One other thing that's noteworthy is there is across the retention strap the word time is printed here. Um, you do need to note there is a pin in every stop the bleed kit is a pin. You take that pin, you note the time the tourniquet was applied. That'd be very important to the doctors and the nurses that receive that patient uh, long, ter long term care. So, uh, so now I'm starting to feel a little bit of tingle in my left hand. Tourniquets are uncomfortable. Tourniquets are a little bit painful and that's normal. That's not an indication that you've done anything wrong or the tourniquet's been applied incorrectly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I tell my students when they apply tourniquets to themselves and each other, if you're not moaning and groaning, you're not doing it correctly. So uh, in all actuality, that is very true. Tourniquets, and when you think about what a tourniquet actually has to do to work effectively, is it has to squeeze your arm and, and to cut off the blood flow. So quite naturally, if someone that was very strong squeezed your arm, it would hurt. So it's the same concept. A lot of people think for some reason that tourniquets should be comfortable. Uh, unfortunately, they, they are not. Um, so I can leave this on for a long, long time. I don't necessarily want to, but I can if I need to and I will, with, with no long-term effects, right? I know I'm not going to lose the limb. Now, let me jump back to that amputation statement I made earlier. Have there been amputations where tourniquets were in play? Of course, but that limb was already in, uh, in limbo, right? So that, that it, the tourniquet, in other words, was not the reason that that limb was amputated, if that makes sense. Um, that, that limb was already at risk and had to be taken off for other reasons due to the mechanism of injury, due to the trauma it received or whatever. So this is not going to be the cause of the loss of that limb. This may be the cause, the only reason that that individual lived to tell about the loss of that limb. So let's make that very clear. And you can improvise tourniquets. It's not recommended. 
Uh, the vast majority of improvised tourniquets fail. Um, there were 20 some odd improvised tourniquets at the Boston bombing. The vast majority of them were not successful. Um, some did slow ble bleeding down long enough to get the patient to an emergency department. Uh, the vast majority did not, were not successful, not successfully applied. Um, another thing that, that's worth, bears mentioning is that uh, tourniquets, as far as cat tourniquets and, and a few others, you can buy them from Amazon. Be very careful of that as the vast majority of Amazon tourniquets are fake and made in China and will bust. So be very careful about that. If your agency or your church or your whoever or you personally want to buy these products, make sure that you buy them from a reputable manufacturer or a reputable vendor like North American Rescue, Drum Emergency Solutions, uh, Medical Gear Outfitters. I mean, there's tons of places that, that are safe to buy from. Amazon is, uh, if you don't really pay attention to what you're doing, you can buy fake products from Amazon, so be very cautious of that. One other tourniquet that I want to mention very quickly is the, uh, the SWAT T. SWAT T is uh, the National Tactical, Tactical Officers Association approved, and it just stands for Stretch, Wrap, and Tuck. So that's what SWAT T stands for, Stretch, Wrap, and Tuck Tourniquet. And basically all this is is just a big rubber band, a big fancy rubber band. Uh, it has a chemical impregnated in it that allows it to, to be more uh, to be a little bit more sticky and kind of stick to itself, so it allows you to get a better hold a little faster. And the way this is applied is that it comes vacuum sealed in a real tight little uh, plastic bag, almost very similar to this gauze here. So it comes about the size of, or smaller of a, of a deck of cards. So you would take the tourniquet out. Of course, you would want to apply it, you know, as high on the limb as you can get it. You just drape this over the limb. This first wrap can be loose. That's totally fine. And once you've got that first wrap down, then you start stretching the tourniquet. And as you stretch, it does not take as much effort as one might think. You simply get to the end, tuck the tail of the tourniquet, and you, you've successfully applied that tourniquet. So that's how the stretch, wrap, and tuck tourniquet works. I'll put this one on my right arm just to give you an example. For self-application, there's a little bit more of a learning curve. You should always buy two tourniquets, train with one, carry the other. So I'll drape this over my arm. I want about a six inch tail. I'm going to loop that first wrap nice and loose so I have somewhere to go with the tail. That's a vital part of this tourniquet application. And then I'm going to start ratcheting this thing down. Once I get to the end, because I've made the first wrap loose, I have somewhere to take the tail. So I'm just going to very simply take the tail and I'm done. So that's how you apply a SWAT T tourniquet, stretch wrap and tuck tourniquet. These tourniquets have uh, thousands of documented saves behind them as do the cat tourniquet, as well, of course, as well. By the way, the cat tourniquet or combat application tourniquet, which you see here in orange, is uh, military approved and is what's currently issued to all branches of the military and, and the vast majority of law enforcement. Hopefully I can get this off without a pocket knife. All right, so that's how the stretch, wrap, and tuck tourniquet works. A cat tourniquet retails for $29.99. A SWAT T retails for between $11 and $12, depending on what, re, uh, what manufacturer or vendor you buy it from. So the next thing we want to talk about is, let me get this out of the way just so I'll have more room to work. The next thing we want to talk about is wound packing. And I'll flip here to, let's see, let's go to move forward just a little bit. There we go. Let's get right here. So let's talk about wound packing. That's the next step in bleeding control. We want to put a tourniquet on anything that we, we deem is life-threatening. Um, now, how do we identify that life-threatening bleed? A uh, large amount of blood leaving the body at a high rate of speed. Obviously, we know arterial bleeding would typically be maybe pulsatile. It may be uh, bright red in color. That's, that would be normal. Uh, if we see a volume of blood that we are concerned about, then we might want to treat that. It's recommended that you treat that, excuse me, as a life-threatening problem until deemed otherwise. Um, underlying clothes are soaked in blood. That's another one of the criteria for uh, a life-threatening bleed. If you assess a patient uh, who's, who appears to be bleeding heavily and all of their clothes are soaked in blood, then you need to find the source of that and attack it. Uh, the next thing to consider would be if you bandage something, like if I were to bandage one of these two wounds here and it bled back through very quickly, that would be a life-threatening bleed and I would apply a tourniquet immediately. Uh, so the next thing to think about is what about the areas of the body that I can't necessarily put a tourniquet on or I want to use hemostatic gauze or wound packing in conjunction with a tourniquet. So what I'm going to do there is, and we'll use this one uh, as a good example because it's close to me, is we'll, we'll use um, either 
a compressed non-hemostatic gauze or a compressed hemo hemostatic gauze, which is, uh, this is probably the most commonly seen hemostatic agent on the market is from uh, Z-Medica, it's quick clot combat gauze. This is what you'll most often, often see on, uh, you, you will likely most often see this on a soldier, uh, and including law enforcement now and in the civilian market as well, this is what's sold in a Stop the Bleed kit. These retail for right around $40 a pack. This is a non-hemostatic agent, this compressed gauze, still three by four yards, um, and it's about $3 a pack, so you can see the tremendous difference there. But you get what you pay for. Here's the deal. A hemostatic gauze uh, will, will create a clot and stop bleed with direct pressure within three minutes or less. This takes an average of six minutes, or, uh, give and take. So, and of course, environmental concerns, different patients, different results that you have to take into account as well. But on average, you're looking at about a three-minute uh, time frame here versus six or more. Um, another thing is that this does have a, a strip in it, so you can see it on x-ray. It's very helpful uh, in the emergency department. So let's actually open this up and look at this material. Quick clot combat gauze, Cheeto, Celox, other hemostatic agents on the market are impregnated with a, chem a chemical that works with the body's natural clotting factor to create a clot very quick. This right here is nothing but Z-folded. Regular old standard gauze like you buy from Walmart. It just happens to be folded in a different manner and allows it to be compressed. So when we pack a wound, the first thing we want to do is wrap the tip of our finger and kind of create what's called the power ball and introduce it directly into the bottom of the wound cavity. If we can feel where that blood's coming from, we want to, we want to get right on top of that and apply direct pressure. Now it's going to be one finger on top of the next, and we would simply wound pack one finger on the top of the next, maintaining steady pressure throughout the entire process. At no point are both my fingers out of the injury uh, outside of the wound cavity because otherwise I'm not applying pressure. So I'm going to pack this entire wound front, back, side to side, up, down, left, right, however you want to describe it. And the reason for that is because we know that when something enters the body, a piece of shrapnel, a, a bullet, or whatever it may be, it can create cavities that we can't see externally. So we want to make sure that we've got everything uh, filled all the way. Now I'm going to show you a good example of some what I call internet medicine. All right. Now we're all adults here, so I'll just I'll just go ahead and say this. There are people out there that are teaching that tampons are appropriate for stop the bleed kits. Now, I'm sure most of us in our in our lifetime have for one reason or the other have seen a tampon. So from right here down is what I was able to wound pack there. So I want you to look at that and ask yourself if you think a tampon will be appropriate for a stop the bleed kit. Of course the answer is no. Uh, but that just goes to show you uh, you know, I'm going to lose my limb if I apply a tourniquet. Uh, I can, you know, I can buy, uh, I've talked to soldiers, uh, many, many soldiers who have been, over, been overseas several times to talk about getting tampons and care kits. Um, these are the kind of things that we're fighting, uh, the kind of uh, myths and, uh, and misunderstandings that we're fighting as a result of, of this, uh, this kind of class. But we're, we're making great headway. That, I'm glad to report that. So, um, so quick clock combat gauze or... A non-hemostatic agent would be uh, introduced into the wound cavity. We would pack it completely full. There's nothing in the world wrong. There's no rule that says you can't use a tourniquet and then wound pack if you feel necessary, if you feel the need, right? So we're going to wound pack this. So I've got this completely packed for the sake of time. We'll take any excess we have, pile that on top, and then dress that wound. So the next thing we want to talk about very briefly is, is um, some kind of trauma dressing. We need to keep in mind that, um, you know, it, you can use an ACE bandage, that, that would work just fine, but something that's intended for trauma and that will allow you to apply direct pressure is obviously going to be much more uh, advantageous to the patient and to you as the caregiver. So this is an a, a Israeli dressing. Uh, there are smaller and, and different versions of this uh, available. Um, I have some other examples uh, off camera here, but this is just one of many. So the way this Israeli dressing works is, is you would simply put the white pad on top of the problem. So we put the white pad here. Notice that it has a plastic knuckle on top, and this is my point of entry. So I'm going to take the bandage and weave it through the Israeli dressing, pull the slack out, and reverse my drag. All right, pull the slack out. I'm going to cover both sides of the bandage, just traditional, nothing fancy here. Each time I come over, I'm going to pull the slack out. If I need to apply more pressure to the wound cavity, each time I come over, I'm going to twist pull the slack out. 
And I would continue this process until the wound, until this bandage was completely used up, and then I would clip it in place and secure it. The, one of the big takeaways from tourniquet application, from bandage application, is that they need to be self-sufficient. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to carry a tourniquet around when I can just use my belt. Um, never, never seen a belt successfully used independently of itself. The problem is, is with a tourniquet is that I need to apply the tourniquet and be able to let it go and it be and it stand alone without my assistance. Um, I may not have the time or the luxury or the environment may not allow me to just walk around holding this thing on, on myself or someone else. So it's not a good plan. So tourniquet uh, high and tight, as high on the limb as we can get it, obviously not on top of a joint. To occlude the blood flow to the extremity, if we need to pack one of these junctional areas like the neck, the shoulders, the groin, or the armpits, those are areas that we would traditionally typically pack if we, that would not be amenable to a tourniquet. Now, that being said, there are junctional tourniquets on the market. They are bulky and they are expensive. So very few of them are just out there floating around. Uh, I do have examples of those. I do teach a class that requires students to learn how to use junctional tourniquets, but it's not taught in the, in the uh, more common stop the bleed course, which is typically you know a three to four hour class. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is, that is taught in Stop the Bleed, is what do we do with penetrating trauma? Uh, I'll tell you what, let me, let me back up just a second. I want to show you guys these real quick. This is, these are two products here that uh, are widely used now, and, and they work really, really well. Uh, great teaching tool for those of you that might, you know, want it or need it. Uh, this is a wound cube from Focus Research Group, um, and it has one, two, three, four, it has four different wound cavities already built inside of it that are uh, there to mimic four different calibers of, of firearms. Um, so really good teaching tool for wound packing there. And it does require uh, a little bit of lubrication. However, uh, I have actually uh, made this one to where it will bleed. I, I, all I did was just drill a hole in the side. We put a siphon in the side and I just pump blood through it. So it's a really good teaching tool. This one here is obviously set up to bleed as well. And this is from Techline Trauma, and it's a gunshot in a box. So they have a face in a box, a laceration in a box, a nose in a box, and a gunshot in a box. They have all kinds of stuff in a box. So uh, really great tools here for wound packing. Um, this would obviously mimic more of an exit wound versus an entry. And some of these over here uh, being smaller and a little bit harder to pack would mimic more of what, what an entry wound might, might look like. So just wanted to point those out. So let's talk very briefly about um, penetrating trauma we do talk a lot about that and Stop the Bleed, and it is something that, that we want people to understand that they can deal with. Uh, the vast majority of the wound patterns that we saw from the um, Jason Aldean shooting were to the upper thoracic cavity. Um, so those people had some respiratory issues that um, might have otherwise been able to, to assist them with had, they been, had the, those individuals been trained and equipped with the right stuff. Um, and that includes, of course, law enforcement responding as well. But... Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a manufactured chest seal, but it is, of course, recommended. It's always better to have the, the product that's built for that, the tool that's made for that job versus trying to uh, MacGyver your way through something. So this is, a, this is a hyphen vent from North American Rescue. This is their mini. Of course, they do make non-vented chest seals, North American Rescue, H&H. &H. Um, there's bowling chest seals and, and lots of other manufacturers. This is a new product from H&H &H Medical. It's called the H-Vent. And um, the way this works is, is obviously you would apply this over penetrating trauma um, to the chest, the, the back, the rib cage, you know, the belly, wherever. Um, and it has six ventilation ports around the center point here where this would cover, or this would be laid right on top of the center of the wound. And it allows, of course, any chest seal that's vented is gonna allow air and blood out and won't allow any air or blood back in and hopefully prevent what may eventually become a tension in my thorax. So, um, so that's what this is about. This, this product works really well. I just tested, uh, as a matter of fact, just this week, as a matter of fact, I, I just tested these two particular chest seals on a pig, um, and, and we had him uh, hooked up to a pump, a pig skin, piece of large piece of meat, had it hooked up to a pump. These two, turn, or these two uh, chest seals, rather, worked uh, flawlessly. Uh, as intended by the manufacturer. We only saw a failure point in the way that H&H &H folds their chest seal, this H vent, but I've contacted the company and they, they said that they're working on that. So I'm really excited to see the difference in, in how just something as simple as a fold can make. 
Um, so here's the deal with the chest seal. What we teach in Stop the Bleed is, is that if, if you encounter penetrating trauma from the belt buckle to the Adam's apple front, back, side to side, you should apply an occlusive dressing over that hole. Air should only be communicated from the nose and the mouth. We know that. And when air and blood start to communicate through holes in the chest or the back or wherever they may be, that's not a good thing. And it can cause you some respiratory issues, which would not be good for the patient. So what we do is, is we use a chest seal if we have them. And if we don't, we use something like this. And this is what I like to teach. Uh, there, there are very few things that I tell people to improvise, but wound packing is something that you, you can get by with improvising. And chest seals are something that in a bind you can get by with improvising. You can make a chest seal out of this plastic as long as it's non-permeable. You put it over the hole and you tape it on all four sides. Um, and of course that would apply to you know what goes in might come out. If you've been shot or stabbed, you may have two wounds instead of one entry and exit. Um, but you can use rubber gloves, plastic Walmart bags, uh, pieces of plastic off other equipment that may be used on scene, things like that. So, uh, but the, the, the big goal there is, the big takeaway is that air should only be coming out of your nose and your mouth. If air is coming out of a hole in your chest or your rib cage or your back, you need to cover it with something non-permeable, like preferably a, a manufactured chest seal that will allow blood and air to escape as to not, as to avoid building more tension inside the chest, uh, obviously, and, and, and potentially uh, compromising their respiratory rate, which will get worse if it's not addressed. So those are the three uh, core concepts of Stop the Bleed there. You have um, tourniquet application, which should be uh, immediate if life-threatening bleeding is, is uh, suspected or seen or identified. Um, wound packing to those junctional areas where tourniquets would not be ap uh, applicable, and that would be the neck, the shoulders, the armpits, the groin, places like that that we can't traditionally uh, put a tourniquet on very easily without those junctional tourniquets available. Um, we want to use a hemostatic gauze if at all possible. If that's not available, we can use um, non-hemostatic agent like uh, just plain sterile roll gauze, a t-shirt, shop rags, paper towels. We can use whatever we've got if that's, if that's all we've got. Um, so Stop the Bleed kits are sold all over the place. Um, obviously, you know, some are bigger than others. This is a, a good example of a Stop the Bleed kit that, uh, that you might find in a, Troy, in a City of Troy vehicle. Um, uh, just, just to use Troy again as an example, we have a large public access Stop the Bleed kit inside of our City Hall. Uh, and then we have Stop the Bleed kits on all of our police cars, all of our water, sewer, and electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. And of course, all those employees have been trained on how to use all that stuff. Uh, but you can get a Stop the Bleed kit that weighs 800 pounds if you're willing to spend the money. Uh, a kit like this retails for, I'd say, anywhere between $55 and $75, depending on what all you want them to put in it. And most of them are custom built. Uh, to the specifications of uh, or the needs of that particular facility, whether it may be a church or a factory or, or a municipality or whatever the case may be. Um, but inside of a kit, uh, the bare essentials would be the cat tourniquet, a trauma dressing of some kind to apply pressure to a wound, uh, some type of hemostatic agent, or if, you, if, you, if cost is of concern, you can cut down dramatically on the cost of a kit by replacing the hemostatic gauze with non-hemostatic agent. Uh, which is going to take take the cost of the kit down by approximately forty dollars per kit, um, and then of course a pair of gloves and a sharpie. So those are just your true bare essentials. Those three things. Now understand, as far as penetrating trauma is concerned, most stop the bleed kits can and do come with some type of manufactured chest seal for penetrating trauma. However, if they if you don't have those products available to you, you can use the plastic that this comes in. As a chest seal, you just have to have some tape to, you know, affix it to the patient's chest or wherever. So that, that's something to think about as well. Um, there, are, there are smaller kits available. They don't necessarily have to be that big. There are some pocket size kits available. This is a pocket kit that I carry with me 24-7, uh, and it has a SWAT tourniquet in it, four feet of hemostatic agent, and a chest seal. So it, it addresses the three uh, major causes of death. Uh, that I can I can address just just strictly out of this little Ziploc bag here, so uh, so it's it's not a uh, I, I have a lot of people tell me I would love to carry a stop the bleed kit but I just carry too much stuff already and and as you can see that's not an excuse anymore we've we've scaled it down enough to where anybody should be able to carry it um, at any time so one of the things I want to talk about also is the National Stop the Bleed Day. National Stop the Bleed Day was on March 31st, 2018. Like I said, we trained well over 30,000 people nationwide, over 800 here in Alabama. We have uh, instructors 
in all the major cities in Alabama that are running straight down the center of the uh, state. So if, if anybody out there wants to know who's the, who's the closest state or who's the closest instructor to me, I can get you that information. I'm obviously being the state coordinator, I'm in contact with these people. Um, we'd like to expound on that next year. We'd like to expand our, our network of instructors. We'd like to expand our network of classes and train more people. That's what it's all about. And of course, everything associated with National, National Stop the Bleed Day is free. It's all nonprofit, nobody's making a dime, and that's the way it should be. Um, and we are going to, I heard through the grapevine that uh, we are going to expand the National Stop the Bleed Day to month. So it's gonna be National Stop the Bleed Month in 2019, um, which will give everybody a lot more breathing time uh, to be able to teach more people, train, bring more sponsors on board, et cetera, to make it a little easier on everybody involved. It was a bit of a time crunch this first go around because it was the first ever and we were all learning as we were going. So um, if uh, Alabama was, a uh, little, little shout out to the governor's office, Alabama was the first state in the country to um, acknowledge a national stop or a statewide national, or excuse me, a statewide stop the bleed week. So we were the first ones to do that. And Texas, Tennessee, and several other states, I think uh, California and several others followed suit. And, uh, and, and we kind of led by example, so I'm really proud of that, that we, we were the first one in the country to acknowledge that and sign a proclamation and have the governor's office designate uh, the week of the 26th through the 31st to stop the bleed week in the state of Alabama. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I'm sure I'm leaving something out, but I cannot think of, of what it might be. Do I have any questions or comments? Well, I have one question. Mm -hmm. I hope we'll have a few more here in the audience. I, I understand that you said not to MacGyver your way through this stuff. So if I am in my car and I come upon an accident or something like that, what are the things that I can do besides just calling 911 sure. to help in that well, situation? One of the things that I, 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 I neglect to say sometimes, and I always have to go back and correct myself, direct pressure is always the first line of defense. Don't, don't get me wrong. It, not, every, not every person who's bleeding uh, needs a tourniquet. Uh, not, you know, um, it's like when you, when you hand somebody a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Um, it, it, not everybody who's bleeding needs a tourniquet. So direct pressure is always the first line of defense. You can always apply direct pressure to anything. As far as a bleed is concerned, uh, you can always apply direct pressure first and should. Uh, if this individual here, uh, this mannequin was on the ground and I had to, that, you know, there's a junctional area or a junctional wound there that is not amenable to a tourniquet, I would put a knee in that as I'm preparing my equipment. So always think outside of the box. Um, obviously, I don't have the materials up here with me right now, but you can improvise a tourniquet. And it can be done somewhat successfully, but the problem is that they oftentimes fail. So we, we really want to hammer it home with people, get the training, buy the equipment, and do it right. Plan, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best would be my advice. <laughs> Just to remind you, this is the opportunity for you to call or email with any questions you might have. Do we have any questions here in the room? I have a question. So if you have a church or an organization that's interested in doing something like this, mm -hmm. should they have uh, a medical director or some type of physician coverage or anything to get the hemostatic agents, or is that just over the counter? No, ma'am. This uh, hemostatic gauze is over the counter. Um, like I said, Traditionally, you're looking at about $40 a pack, uh, between $40 and $45 a pack, depending on where you buy it. You do not have to have a prescription for, for this product. Um, anybody can buy it, excuse me, online. Um, there, I, there are only maybe one or two places in Alabama, I think, that sell it retail, in-store. Uh, the vast majority of it would be purchased online. Uh, the same with uh, the tourniquets and the chest seals. It's all available to anybody who, who would who would like to carry it, but of course we, it doesn't do you a lot of good to carry it without the training. And, um, you know, and, and I do consult with a lot of church security teams, especially uh, that, that, those kind of, those type of calls have increased since that shooting in Texas. Um, and uh, a lot of churches are really taking, uh, taking heed to, to what can happen to them and, and realizing that just because we're in the South doesn't mean we're exempt. Um, I think for a long time that was kind of the general consensus was that that just doesn't happen in Alabama, and I think now they're seeing that it can, um, which is a good thing. Um, so I highly recommend that churches uh, take advantage of Stop the Bleed courses. 
not only do you need to train your security teams, but, uh, but you also need to think about just the general population in the church because that security team may be very overwhelmed if there is a mass casualty incident. You may, uh, that, that's one reason why public access bleeding kits need to have, in my opinion, need to have multiple individual kits inside of them because if, if there's six people in this room that are injured and bleeding in a life-threatening manner, I can hand six kits out. Instead of having tying myself down to one large kit, I can just hand out six or ten or however many smaller kits. We can treat multiple people. And uh, another question I get a lot is how many people can you treat per, per kit? Uh, the general consensus on that is about three people per kit, but that's a rough estimate. It just depends on, it depends on a lot of different factors. But in general, two to three people per kit. Uh, because we have to assume that not everybody will have the same wound patterns and type of injury and that kind of thing. So, Anyone else have a question? Well, you talked about um, being able to treat multiple people sure. with that one kit. Um, if you've got someone with multiple wounds that are entry and exit um, and different extremities, would you have to use all of or multiple kits kit on or one, on multiple one patient. kits or something like that? Well, it just depends. I mean, you're, you're going to have to make an, a quick, uh, dirt, what, I, what I call ditch medicine assessment on that individual um, and, and just determine what they need. Of course, we want to address what's going to kill this person first, the fastest, and, and let's attack that. Um, the, the primary thing to think about in, the, in a case like that would be what's going to kill them first, what's bleeding the most, how can we stop it? Let's get that stopped, and then let's go back over and find out what's going to kill them next. And, address, and let's take it from the worst and, and knock it down to the, to the least. Uh, that, that's, that's the primary goal there. But that's a hard question to answer because there's so many variables. Uh, but, tr you know, I've, I've done TCCC and TECC training where they will put mannequins in front of you that, that do require just more equipment than you've got. You, one thing to keep in mind, this is one of the core concepts of tactical combative casualty care, is you'll always be limited uh, by, by what equipment you have available to you in your environment. Uh, if, if I'm out and about, you know, like in this building right now, this may be all I have. Um, and I'm, if I'm lucky, maybe I'm able to treat myself and one other person or, you know, two, two individuals with, with this one kit, but that may not always be the case. So it's just, it's just situationally dependent. Another question? So uh, this is a familiarization course, right. and you had uh, discussed with some of the junctional wounds that you may have to have additional training. What are the different levels of training? That okay, are there? very good question. So, so the the stop the bleed course is usually three to four hours, and covers in depth the material that I've gone over here today. Um, that that's one reason why it's, it's hard to kind of put all this in a in a one hour cap, but it it, it gets the point across. Um, it's easier when you have several hours to teach it because you can really go into depth and explain to people how we bleed to death, what, what happens to the body when you're bleeding in a life-threatening manner, and, and go much more in depth and get hands-on with all of this material. One thing I want you guys to understand is the Stop the Bleed course is a very hands-on course. It is not, it is instructor-led, but it is not just four hours of, of a boring PowerPoint. It's, it's maybe 30 minutes of a boring PowerPoint, and the rest of it is all fun, hands-on stuff. But when you're having fun, you're learning. When you're talking and laughing, you're learning. Um, so to directly answer your question, um, Stop the Bleed is kind of where, where everybody tends to start. If you would like to take it to the next step, so to speak, you would take a, uh, I would recommend a course called Tactical Emergency Casualty Care's First Care Provider. And, uh, and that is an eight-hour course, and it's for civilians and law enforcement or EMS or whoever, you know, whoever wants to attend. Um, and it goes much more into depth because you have extra time uh, allotted. You can go much more into depth about uh, the respiratory stuff. You, you, we do talk, we do teach um, airway adjuncts, NPAs, OPAs, things like that. We talk about needle decompression. We talk about a lot more in-depth material. So um, that typically would be the the normal uh, you know ladder of, of training would be. A stop for a, for a civilian uh, or, or law enforcement population or maybe a church security team would be stop the bleed, you know, maybe the first care provider. And then if they really wanted to take it to the next level, they go through TCCC or TECC, one of those two. So I would, I would take it and I would label them in that order. 
Um, we have an email question. Are there any ra legal ramifications that I would have to worry about if I help someone that's unconscious? All of that, well, that's implied consent if they're unresponsive. All of this material is covered by the Good Samaritan Law. This is all considered to be first aid and is covered by the Good Samaritan Law. There's been a lot of study work done on that uh, in Alabama and in a lot of other states because people were concerned about it, especially when it started first gaining popularity. You know, people were just buying up this material, and so there was a lot of questions about now, you know, the, the could I get myself in trouble if I apply a tourniquet to somebody? Um, but, uh, but no, it's all covered by the Good Samaritan Law. It'll be just the same if you were doing CPR or using an AED or something like that. For those who don't know what the Good Samaritan Law is, could you explain it a little bit? In a nutshell, it's just protection um, for the layperson, uh, law enforcement, EMS, doctors, all sorts of people are listed, and, and, and I would encourage anybody, regardless of your profession, to go online and look up the, the, the Good Samaritan Law and read it. It's not that long, and it's not that, that hard of a read. Um, and, and it's pretty interest, interesting to see just how, how many people are covered under the Good Samaritan Law. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, but I think the only people that aren't covered under that are the manufacturers of AEDs. But if you're using an AED, if you're doing, as long as you're not doing anything that would be considered grossly negligent by a jury of your peers, um, then you are covered. Uh, now, would I recommend that you perform surgery on the side of 231? No, I would not. But can you apply a tourniquet and wound pack and put a chest seal on? Absolutely, you can. You know, it, it, would, it would be, uh, as far as the law is concerned, the Good Samaritan law, it would be no different than me putting a Band-Aid over a skint knee. Do you think that you could elaborate on some situations that you've been in where you've had to use these tourniquets? Sure. Um, there, was, uh, there was a police officer not too terribly long ago uh, in, the, uh, in my area where he was shot uh, in the leg, in his lower right leg, and a tourniquet was rapidly applied to him and stopped the bleeding instantly. Uh, that is one of many, many cases. Uh, another uh, incident was a, in Eufaula, Alabama. It was on the news not too long ago. A Eufaula police officer saved an individual's life by applying a tourniquet uh, pre-hospital. Uh, the, the reason that law enforcement does run into uh, those scenarios more is because statistically there's just more of them. They're already out on the road. They arrive on scene faster. So they encounter these problems faster than the ambulance and the fire truck do, um, normally anyway. But there are lots and lots of examples in in not only in my area but just in Alabama in general where there's been a lot of lives saved with with these products in this in this material uh, the list is is pretty extensive but just just recently uh, in my area where I'm from there was a a tourniquet placed on a police officer after he was shot uh, we I say we but uh, some people that I'm I know and work with have applied tourniquets to individuals who have been injured in life-threatening manner and saved their life. Uh, so I have personally trained and been, and been fortunate enough to be involved with incidents like that, that where these, these, these products have been used to, and they, they work. Um, obviously we know that from you know, them being proven on the battlefield and as well as in the civilian market. Well, thank you so much for all the information. I feel like I've learned a lot. <laughs> so, and thank you guys so much for watching. Um, you can be able, you, excuse me, you will be able to watch this later on On Demand. And have a great day.